Welcome to this flight of The Retail Pilot. I'm your host, Ken Pilot, former CEO and current brand advisor, retail tech investor, and board member. I'm thrilled to share with you the insights from some of retail's legends and leaders, as well as my perspective on retail today. This podcast is sponsored by the following. January Digital is a marketing leadership company solving business challenges through consulting, media excellence, and actionable analytics for some of the most innovative, growth-oriented brands in the country, including Carhartt, Kendra Scott, Strivecton, and Steve Madden. Made up of January Consulting and January Digital, they offer strategic leadership services and full-funnel media planning, execution, and optimization, leveraging data to provide insights, yielding client success. Bluecore's software solution turns anonymous online shoppers into known customers and repeat customers. Bluecore enables retailers to personalize and optimize their email, SMS, and site marketing campaigns by delivering targeted and relevant messages based on where every customer is in their journey. Bluecore replaces annoying high volume messaging with high value messaging. Customers include Allo Yoga, Neiman Marcus and Gap. On today's flight of the Retail Pilot, we have Scott Tannen, CEO and founder of Bolin Branch, the world's leading luxury betting brand, which he founded in 2014 with his wife, Missy. Scott started his career in communications at Nabisco Craft Foods, working with brands including Altoids, Oreo, Lifesavers, and a dozen of others. He also oversaw digital communications and marketing for Kraft Foods, entire portfolio of Nabisco cookies and crackers, confections, and snack brands. He later went on to join Wrigley, establishing the digital division of their global portfolio of brands. Prior to co-founding Bowling Branch, Scott was the founder and president of CandyStand.com, which he launched in 2008 and sold to Publishers Clearinghouse in 2010. Scott sits on the advisory boards of several technology and consumer goods companies, and is a Vanderbilt University alum. Scott resides in New Jersey with his wife, Missy, their three children, and two dogs. Scott, welcoming you to the Retail Pilot. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, Ken. Thanks for having me. Been a while since we connected last, and uh, looking forward to getting an update on what's happening at Bolin Branch. But before we jump into it, just give us a high-level description of Bolin Branch, who the company is, and what you guys do. Sure. So Bolin Branch... We are, if not the, we're certainly in the handful of leading luxury linens, bedding, home decor, manufacturers and retailers here in the U.S. and around the world. What makes us a little bit different, my wife and I started the company 10 years ago, not having any background in textiles. uh, And I think that gave us maybe a little bit of our unfair advantage because we didn't inherit any of the, the way that textile companies have been run forever. So we built a really unique supply chain that values humanity and transparency and traceability and sustainably, uh, sustainability from beginning to end. And so we're not only making really incredible quality products, but we can tell a very specific story about where those products came from. And our customers feel really good about the fact that they understand that, that they didn't cause any harm along the way. You have a digital background. Your wife was a school teacher. How did you guys find slash land on we're going to launch what we're brand. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wish I could say that everything in my life had been leading up to the moment that I jumped into the textiles industry. But, you know, the truth is, is that we're consumers. And I think so many great businesses start from people that are consumers that find something about a business or an industry that they're participating in. It just doesn't work as well as they think it should work. And that was our case. So we were shopping for new linens. We had moved from a queen bed to a king bed. And we're just sort of frustrated, confused, and all those things in between by all the options in the marketplace and the fact that, you know, here's a product in a product category that really everybody participates in, and yet nobody really knows a whole lot about. And to me, that felt like, you know, an industry is, I was trying to find what I wanted, couldn't find what we wanted. And it started as, well, what would it take to make this as a rabbit hole you might fall into from a research standpoint? I'm just like, why is this so weird? And the next thing you know, you know, you're sending your life savings to a guy in India, opening a boat shows up eight months later with sheets on it. That's it. It, And did your wife initially, did Missy spot this? Was it you or was this a simultaneous yes? No, Missy would be the first one to tell you that this is one of many goofy business ideas I've had. And the only one that she decided to step in 
to make sure that I didn't bankrupt our family in the process. Because she likes to say she wouldn't trust me to pick out her own linens. So she certainly wasn't going to let me do that for the world. But well, it's a funny story, Ken. So I started probably the way a lot of folks do. And Missy and I both encountered the problem together. And I was like, well, you know, I was reading the right count doesn't mean anything and this and then, you know, it's a little bit of the okay, honey. And I actually went and and I got so obsessed with it that I started meeting with importers and exporters. And one of the meetings that I had was an importer that ironically today makes for some of the other even DTC brands out there. And because we live in New Jersey, so the, you know, the textile industry is all kind of here. And I had a meeting with them and it came back and I'm like, do you know what hand feel is? <laughs> She's like, oh my God. And I had another meeting where they were going to finally give me some pricing. And I'm like, they just need some designs. And, you know, Missy may have been a third grade teacher, but she's an artist. And I was like, can you just come up with some designs? You know, they told me it can't just be square and white. And so she's like, you know, what are you doing? And I was like, actually, why don't you just come to the meeting with me? Don't tell them you're my wife. Pretend we're an actual company. And like, come. And she's like, no. And one of her favorite restaurants, Houston's, was right near their office. And I bribed her. I said, I'll buy you lunch if you pretend and come to this meeting with me. And so she came and, you know, watching her, you know, that was the point that we went from doing what a lot of people do, which is private labeling things, to saying, we've got to make this ourselves because it doesn't exist. And that was the turning point. Bowl and Branch. What's, where did the name come from? What does it mean? So, so if you can envision, you know, kind of envision a cotton plant, you're going to see that white puffy fiber. And that grows out of a shell, which is called the bowl on the cotton plant and which grows on a branch. Now, we had tried a lot of different names amongst our friends, our grandmother's names, you name it. We even incorporated this into our company mode and placed our first PO before we even had a company name. But, you know, organic cotton and cotton itself is, is so key to the differentiation in the business that we thought it made sense for, you know, the company's name to reflect, you know, the very fiber that makes up, you know, that's what our products stand out. Not a whole lot else, just cotton. When you launched in 2014, where was the competitive set then? I know today we've got a lot of players in your space. Sure. Brooklyn and Parachute, the company store was purchased mm -hmm. by Depot. Who was out there when you were launching and was it challenging to get funding? When we launched, to be honest, the entire category was offline. It was big box retailers, private labels, Bed Bath & Beyond, the department stores. And, and what we found from a consumer behavior standpoint is convenience and proximity was driving most of the purchases, right? So my old sheet's ripped. What's closest to me? Is it a Bloomingdale's? Is it a Bed Bath & Beyond? Is it a Target? And that's where I'm just going to go. So, you know, the positive emotions of buying bed sheets was equivalent to like buying a dishwasher, right? It was not, you know, I mean, when you think about it, such an intimate product. You know, so there really weren't any DTC businesses, at least that I could find, although the law of simultaneous invention, right? So many people somehow or another are thinking of the same thing at, at the same time. From a funding standpoint, I didn't want funding. I mean, I was very lucky to be in a position where I didn't need funding. I, you know, you said I was in the digital space, I actually had a video game company, which I sold in, in 2010 um, and, you know, was in a unique position as somebody that, you know, wasn't a 20 something year old founder, as well as, you know, having a a little bit of capital, is able to use the SBA and debt to drive the business, which when you have a vision around a business and your vision is beyond profit loss and the intent to sell at some point, it's really helpful to be able to control your own destiny without investors. So we didn't take on any outside capital for our first three years. And at that point, we were already profitable. We were well on our way. And I did that at that point because I was carrying $5 million in debt and so I only raised capital to basically reduce my own debt position at that point. So the fact that you were self-funded actually helped you get to profitability earlier and probably was the key to your success, obviously, to, to go out and look for capital and meet with either venture or private equity and say, hey, we're profitable. They must have thought something was wrong with your business. Well, it's funny you say that because I would always take meetings with venture capital. I'm not a big fan of the behaviors that venture capital drive into businesses. And I think if you look at some of our DTC competitors that did raise capital, the reason either some of them don't exist anymore or it's even the ones you mentioned, I know are really struggling is the fact that they were focused on the metrics that VC was driving, which is what is going to get you to the next funding cycle, right? And think about it. Like if you really take a step back, raising funding and raising capital as a going concern as a business isn't really a mark 
of success. It means that your business can't, with its own cash flow, can't fund its growth. So the need for extra capital is when you want to supercharge growth. But to me, there's two types of businesses, the ones that make money and the ones that don't. And so, you know, when you're supercharging top line on really poor fundamentals, low margins, too much staff, you know, spending that that is, you know, you got five founders or whatever that all need to get paid a lot of money and that kind of thing. It brings about, I think, a lot of behaviors that aren't creative to building a long-term sustainable business. We've been in this for 10 years. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here for a long, long time. I still, you know, I'm the largest individual shareholder in the business and will continue to be because I enjoy the business and I believe there's a great future for the business. I'm not focused on building a business for an exit. L. Catterton is, I believe, your largest partner. You took in our only partner. No partner. They invested $100 million in 2019, probably just before valuations and the world of investing in consumer brands and products slipped for a while <laughs> through the pandemic sure. and even into today. What were you looking to do or what have you done with the capital? It's sitting on the balance sheet. So you might find me to be a moron that I raised capital and didn't use it, but we didn't move to. Look, Catterton, you know, we raised capital from Catterton to do a couple of things. First of all, I want to clean out my cap table. I had, you know, at that point when I did raise some money, I raised from truly friends and family, right? Most people are sitting on the opportunity to have really great returns, right? And again, these are not necessarily your traditional investors. These are folks that I know that have kids that are going to be going to college at some point and that sort of thing. And so the opportunity to, to find liquidity was something I wanted for them because I intended to continue to be aggressive in growing the business. So that was my primary motivation in, in bringing in Catterton or bringing in an entity. In Tottering themselves, look, their playbook, they've forgotten more about consumer business than most people will ever know. You know, having experience building restoration hardware, seeing the rise and fall of Peloton, you look across their portfolio and the close relationship they have with LBMH. I looked at this as an opportunity to learn a lot in the business when I continue to do so. They are amazing partners and we have, you know, a really, really strong relationship. And I think that, you know, what's unique about us is the fact that we have not, you know, we're not just sort of, you know, sustainability focused, but there's a deep level of authenticity around how we operate our supply chain, how we think about business. And so we've been able to share that out across their portfolio as well. And I think, you know, that was important to me, somebody that thought we could bring value to. So like I, Catterton's actually very long on this business. They're not looking to get out at any point. And so, you know, we have a great partnership and a lot of cash on the balance sheet that if we choose to do something with it, we can. And I think in this day and age, you know, as you mentioned, valuations, right? That, you know, yeah, valuations may have slipped, I think, but good businesses still trade at good values. And I think that for us, you know, we can be opportunistic given the strength of the balance sheet. And if we have a tough quarter, we have a tough year, it doesn't hurt us, right? We're able to continue on. And we have a lot of people around the world relying on this business that we need to make sure it does that. Scott, can you share with us just the approximate size of the business in terms of revenue? Yeah. So last year, about 200 million in revenue. So yeah, we're, you know, north of that. We've been profitable. So we broke even first year in business. We've lost a little bit of money our second year in business. I think we went from a million seven in sales year one to 13 million year two. And we ended up losing a lot of money in the process. But we've been profitable every year since. So we're not talking about like, you know, oh, highly adjusted EBITDA profitable, where a real business still produces, you know, real cash that can be reinvested. When I look at your business from launch to now, when you launched, really very focused on top of bed. I mean, it was all about sheets and bedding. That's right. And now it's really grown. It looks to me from an outsider's point of view, who's fairly familiar with the space that you want to own the bedroom and the bathroom since it's adjacent, but at least Everything that is up for grabs in the bedroom, from a consumer point of view, I can go to Bowl and Branch and complete my room. Yeah, I think that's right. I think there's a little bit of nuance to it as well. There are a lot of products we can make. What we're going to make are things that we can actually fundamentally improve, right? So we didn't just launch a pillow by private labeling something that you could private label out there. And as you know, it's very easy. I mean, look at every DTC in every category. They all just private label it. We don't private label a thing, but we wanted to fundamentally re-engineer the pillow, which is what we did and why our pillow is, you know, so well regarded as an example. And so our customers have really, we've built, 
we talked about at the beginning, we wanted to be the first trusted brand at home textiles. And that's how we think about it. And when you think about textiles in general, there's not a lot of consumer trust there. And trust to me comes in that, that your last touch point with the brand has to be as strong as your first touch point, if not stronger. And so every product that we make, Missy and her team are spending quite a lot of time engineering, developing, designing. This is not just kind of creating a design, shipping it to a factory and getting a finished product back. It's a pretty long process. But so our customers have begun to not only push us, but trust us as we move into different segments, right? So when we made the move into bath, we made the move into pillows, you know, top of bed being what we call more the decor side of bed has been a big growth area for us. If we look back five years ago, I think our business was probably 70% sheets and today it's less than half. And so, you know, but we're not in a rush, right? We launched a line of furniture, but again, that's a very limited line. We don't actually care how much we sell. It's just that we're making custom for our stores and and we wanted to make it available to our customers, you know, but we're not going to suddenly pivot from a, a furniture company. 20 years from now, if you look back, you know, you may see a really robust furniture business, but we're going to do that in a way that, that we think is in, in keeping with our, what our customers are, are looking for. It makes sense. I remember walking through Casper in the early days of their store rollout, having a conversation with Philip Krim, who was running the company co-founder at yeah. the time, and couldn't understand how they could show a rug in a bed and not sell it. It's just part mm-hmm. of you know, it's part of problem solving. It's part of the customer experience. It's what people want ease when it comes to a purchase and you're creating a full solution. So you have, I think, six stores or seven stores today. That's right. Why not show everything that you show, even down to paint color? Could, absolutely. Could be for sale or should be. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. In our case, we custom mix our paint colors to match the palette of our sheets, which again, welcome to the world of Missy Tanner. Everything is thought through. You guys are selling paint as well? We are not currently selling paint. Wow, but we'll be on the lookout for Bolin Branch. If you take a strategic cut a little bit differently at it and think about your product line and maybe your color palette as an asset of the brand, then how do you leverage that asset when the customer loves the asset, right? And so, again, we try to be, and look, we're not getting into the paint business. I want to be clear on that, but we could. And so... Oh, look, I buy into the same philosophy that you have, which is that you don't want to fill your retail environments at any selling environment with tons of crap. You want to be thoughtful about what goes in there. But the same thought that you put in, if it, if it engages the customer, give them the opportunity to participate with it. And in, in some cases, you know, there were other companies that were making our lighting fixtures as an example. We just refer them. You want this lighting fixture? It's custom made for us. No problem. Call these guys and you can get it. And, you know, at some point in the future, you know, we may get into lighting. Well, we have a, a partnership right now in our retail stores with Levant Collective. Levant is a very high-end, beautiful fabric care company. They make laundry detergents and other things like that. And we were often asked by our customers, you know, how are you guys carrying, you know, not just what what should I use, but more, how are you guys carrying your sheets? Like Scott and Missy, what do you use? And so this is what we were using. And we reached out to them and we said, guys, you know, we'd love to feature your products in our store. And it's been a wonderful partnership in that regard. So I think we just need to be, you need to be really thoughtful about it. And again, when you deliver that for the customer, you actually earn a lot of trust and feedback, positive feedback at the end of the day, because they realize you're helping them complete their circle. Well, you and Missy also share a fair amount of user-generated content. You're constantly talking about your experiences, sharing customer experiences, but reinforcing your story and the why you're in it and also your passion for it always comes through. Yeah. And I truly am passionate about this business. And again, when I was making video games, I I would have said, I'll never find anything I'm more passionate about than this because I love video games. I still love video games. I play games all the time. You know, there's an aspect of how personal this business is because sleeping is a very intimate thing. It's you and your you know, your partner or just you. And it's about how you feel when no one's around, right? It's not about what the label looks like. It's not about, you know, how cool you look based on what you're wearing or that sort of thing. It's very personal. And the fact that we're able to create products that connect people, especially those who make a product that maybe have been overlooked uh, by a lot of industry and a lot of consumers, and we're able to create this connection and deliver products that people love. Like when they have a hard day at the end of the day and they get into bed and it makes them feel 1% better, knowing that you, that you create something that could have that impact is, it's really kind of contagious. It's powerful. 
carrying on that thought, you also recently launched Origin Track. Share with customers where the product is coming from. For those who are truly curious about your supply chain, how are you getting traction there? What are you seeing the response to Origin Track? It's been unbelievable. We've gotten traction in two places. Number one has been the neat thing about it, and for those who, who aren't aware, because traceability has been core to our business, we've custom built our own ERP systems and everything. Every product we've ever built has been traced from a cotton field right through to the customer's doorstep and everything in between, the weeding, the dyeing, the ginning, cut and sew, you name it. And so there's so much talk about transparency, but transparency without traceability sort of was leaving me a little bit sort of unfulfilled. It's like transparency means I'll tell you everything I know, but if you don't know that much, then how valuable is that to the end customer? And we thought that we could create something. Honestly, it's a result. I watch so much YouTube where people are, you know, it's like, here's a tour of a Tootsie Roll factory or whatever it is. And you see how many views people love kind of getting into something. And so it was like, how can we create that opportunity for people to understand not just where the products come from, but who was making them, why we chose them, what makes them unique, what makes them different. And so it's been amazing to see tens of thousands of customers are going back in time from sheets they made about eight, nine years ago and popping in that code, which has always been on the back from a quality assurance standpoint and seeing, wow, this sheet was, you know, it was ginned in, in Odisha and it was, you know, it was made, you know, finished it out with female owned factory in Madurai, India and that sort of thing. And you know, those stories are really powerful and we're seeing a lot of social sharing. I would say the second way it's been really interesting has been how many other companies have reached out to say, how are you doing this? Like, what's the plan here? And look, the key, there's no quick fix. You have to be tracking things. And if you're tracking things at this level, simply exposing them to the customer is the easy part. And so, you know, my developers wouldn't want to hear me say how easy it was for them to create it because the data was there. But, you know, in truth, that's been really powerful. So I've been spending a lot of time with other companies actually helping them think about traceability. And that's been, it's been to me, I didn't expect it. I didn't expect how many other companies would say, we want to do this. Like we want to be, and and that's how the customer gets smarter. That's how all companies are held to greater accountability is when this becomes not the exception, but it becomes the norm. It's funny. We had Reformation, Hallie Bornstein on the podcast a few weeks ago and same passion for traceability. They actually share all of their factories online with anyone who wants to see where their product's being made. And look, clearly many people feel that's very important. I guess the question for me remains to be around the consumer. What's the valuation? How much more will someone pay for product that's traceable, product that's green? Question for you on that one is there, is that comes into your equation, I'm sure, but customers are buying your product, they think first and foremost, because they like the look, the feel. Absolutely. And then probably feel great about the fact that you do have this more than transparency, as you describe, but traceability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think people will pay a penny more for it. I'll be honest with you. I think that they just might love you a little bit more, right? You might give the consumer something to connect with a little bit differently. You know, retaining customers is so important. And in especially in a category like betting or, you know, I mean, anyone in many categories, customers remembering who you are right? Remembering where they bought this product that they love from is not easy, right? And so giving folks things that help them understand really, you know, the reasons to believe that the product is exceptional, like the product feels great. You're exactly right. You buy this product because it feels great. It lasts all of those things. If we can help them understand why that's the case and understand that there is a real reason why. And the reason why is the fact that, you know, in our supply chain, We're not actually introducing fillers. We're not coating it with formaldehyde so it doesn't wrinkle. We're not doing these things. This is exactly what we're doing. This is where we're doing it. And that's why you love it so much, I think is what helps us retain our customers so well. Let's take a quick break with a word from our sponsors. Predict Spring is a global point of sale platform live in 22 countries. The platform includes mobile POS, endless aisle, fulfillment, inventory management, and client telling, creating a true omni experience for customers and associates. Predict Spring powers Suit Supply, Converse, Lovesack, Decium, Janie and Jack, and Beauclair. Increasing the emotional connection to your product. Yeah, I mean, I didn't invent that idea. <laughs> I like it's a good thing to have last I checked. 
Yeah. Now, let's talk a little bit about distribution, points of distribution, sure. and where the product's available today, where you see it going in the future. Talk to us about availability. Where can I find Bowl and Branch? Yeah, so it's funny. Had you asked me this question in 2014, I would have said, they're going to drag me out of the office in, you know, before we're ever in wholesale environment or we're ever in, or in the retail stores and my how the world changes. You know, so the truth is, is that we're agnostic about where you're going to find our product because we want the product to be where the consumer is looking for it. First and foremost, we are still predominantly a direct-to-consumer business. It's 90% of our business and so something like it. As you mentioned, we have six retail stores. We are opening a number more. We are very methodical and slow on how we do it. We expect every store kind of is not surprising to know what you know about our business. We're opening 80 stores. Like anybody that announces they're opening 30 stores or 80 stores in here, go ahead and short if you can. Well, because it's unless it's Walmart, and that would be a, and you may want to short them anyway, because that'd be just too few. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, so retail is a wonderful thing because it creates not only an environment where people can see and touch and feel all of our products. Keep in mind, the betting industry is still 85% on a flight purchase. So it has not evolved as fast as other. We were approached right before COVID by Nordstrom. who they've had a home business, a small home business for a long time that asked us to partner with them to help them not only relaunch, but really rethink the way they look at home. And so we were doing more work there, which got sort of put on base a little bit during COVID and some of the challenges that they had. But it's now something that that is has come back to the forefront. So we're actually in the process of revamping the home platforms at all of Nordstrom and all 70-something of their locations. And that's rolling out as I speak. I mean, my team's on the West Coast opening some stores right now. So, Scott, would that be a shop and shop, your own space that's dedicated to Bowman? It's part of their store, but it is a dedicated space with our own merchandising and fixturing and, and that sort of thing. You know, again, we would not... I would say, like, I do not want to see Bowen Branch sitting on a sad shelf in a sad retail environment with a sad salesperson. And fortunately, Nordstrom is so customer service oriented. They're a great partner. But we've also rolled out in Bloomingdale's, which we also have, you know, very, very specific fixturing and, and challenges. I don't expect us to go terribly far beyond that, candidly. You know, and, and overall, wholesale is a very, very, very small part of the business, even at when you look at the size of their home businesses at both Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom's, they're not big. And so, but it's an important place from an environment standpoint for us to be, you know, and look, we're still seeing really good growth from a DTC standpoint. Don't believe the hype around, you know, all these companies that say, oh, customer acquisition's broken and whatnot. Yeah, it's getting more expensive because you were underpaying for it, the customer margins. You know, if you have a solid business and a solid business model, there's plenty of growth to be. And so we're continuing to see you know, double digit plus growth in our direct to consumer channels. And and so, yeah, so we're, look, we're available everywhere from a class of trade standpoint, owned retail and direct to consumer will continue to drive the bus for the business. With what you just said, Scott, I'm surprised that your product is available on Amazon. What led to that decision? Not all of our products are available on Amazon, um, a select number. And candidly, it's a defensive play. As much as anything, it's actually a pretty good, good amount of business, but so many people are searching for every brand under the sun on Amazon. I think the number is, I think 65% of all product search is on Amazon and maybe 35 yeah. to 40 is on Google, but it's, you almost have to be there if you have product. Otherwise they'll still search your product and then they'll take you to some like item that's sort of bold and branch like. Yeah, I, exactly. And it's like some generic organic cotton sheet that costs $79 when I know I'm paying more than $79 for the raw cotton from a cotton farmer, right? And so, you know, that's the real challenge is that it's not just that you lose your volume to some knockoff, but what that knockoff stands for is everything we don't believe in. It's everything that we've built our business to compete against. And so we have to be available where the customer is. And so that's why we're on Amazon. I would say, I wish we were in a world where I, I didn't have to be on Amazon because I'd rather my customer service take care of the customer than Amazon's. I'd rather our packaging be delivered. I'd, I'd rather all of those things. But, you know, it, look, it's a nice amount of business. And we do see quite a few customers that make the first purchase on Amazon come back to the business uh, through other channels. I mean, it's all part of marketing, which I just want to shift and talk a little bit more about yeah. at the moment. But if you were to take a look at the business today, the breakout, which you said the majority vast majority of your business now is being mm -hmm. through D2C. 
24 months from now, if you were to look at B2C, maybe even more specifically, online stores, wholesale, yep. and we didn't even talk about contract. I don't know if that's a part of your business that you're even pursuing at this point or is meaningful. But 24 months from now, how would you bring mm-hmm. that where Bull and Branch will be? I mean, uh, retail piece will be bigger just because we'll have more stores. But, you know, I'd still see us being at least two thirds online, two thirds to three quarters online over the next couple of years. Again, we're opening stores. We're not in a race. I think we're opening three more this year, you know, and, and we have a number of stores planned for next year. Actually, next year will be quite a few more, but we're still staying on top of our skis and making sure they're in the right locations. You know, one of the, the areas that has been growing very quickly for us, we make a very large investment in customer service. And when I think about customer service, it's not a one-way street, it's two-way. And so we look at, we do quite a bit of custom selling, custom manufacturing services for consumers, right? I have a private jet and you want sheets, we take care of you. You simply just, you know, need somebody to come into your house and help you look at your bedroom and pick out the right aesthetic and decor. We send our interior designers to you wherever you are in the country. They jump on a plane and, and we go take care of that for you. You know, if you buy a single set of sheets at one of our stores, we will bring it to your house, iron it, and make the bed with you if you want that. And so those bespoke services have become an enormous growth engine for the business. Because when you actually think about it, your cost per acquisition is pretty low. And the customer loyalty you get out of that is extremely high. And so, you know, that's something that blends, it blurs the lines between all of these channels, but is really growing nicely for us. Well, I do love the idea of shop and shops with Nordstrom and Bloomingdale's. I think that's such a good use of capital, really efficient use of capital, and mm-hmm. than the brand versus being just off the shelf. I think you'll exactly. have great growth there, and it's probably extremely profitable as well. Yeah, for sure. You had a little bit of fun with the Met Gala dress for Prabal Goering. How did that even come about? And just share more with us about what you did at the Met Gala. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. So I'll tell you the real origin story here. I don't think I've told anybody else this. The origin story was the fact that I have three teenage daughters that are obsessed with the Met Gala. And the day that Anna Wintour announced the theme for the exhibit as Sleeping Beauties, my daughter, Sophie, who's a sophomore at Clemson, literally called me and she's like, dad, you've got to do something. And I'm like, what, what am I going to do with the Met Gala? And I got off the phone and I mentioned it to somebody on our, our marketing team, this woman, Danielle. And Danielle's like, I know somebody. Let me see if there's something there. And to make a long story short, friend of a friend, we end up getting introduced to Probel. And Probel's uh, an incredible designer with an enormous heart and comes from Nepal and does a lot from a give back standpoint that is fundamentally aligned with what we do at Bull and Branch. And we talked to Probel about like, you know, what are you thinking for the Met Gala this year? And would you ever want to work together on something? And he's like, I would love to use your materials because you know, most people in the fashion industry, they don't see Bowling Branch as a betting brand. They see us as fabric makers. Because again, we're not, we don't buy our fabrics off the shelf. We engineer all of them. And so Bravo and Missy got to talking about some of the things that we had coming down the pipe. And they got together and he was feeling our newest Supima fabric, which just launched. And at this point, it was, you know, early this year before it had launched. And he's like, this is the most spectacular fabric I've ever felt. I want to make a dress out of this. Like, what ideas do you have? And Missy was like, you're the designer. Just go crazy. And so over the next several weeks, he started making designs. And it was just sort of like one thing led to another. And it's the most organic partnership you could ever, ever create. Then as Maria Sharapova gets in the mix, she had this vision for creating a yellow color, a yellow and green ensemble and probably loved it. And we had created fabrics in some other colors, but we took it to a dye house in New York City the week before the Met Gala, changed the color, and what ended up on the red carpet was just, I mean, it looked beautiful. She looked incredible. The dress itself is unbelievable. We actually have, we're going to be touring it around to our retail stores and, and whatnot so people can see it. But I don't think in my career I've ever seen anything generate as much positive press and awareness growth as that did for us. It was, it was a moment, that's for sure. Is the product available for sale or will it be? It is. So the the sheets actually just launched like two weeks ago. And it, it what's unique about it is actually it's cotton we source from here in the States. That So it's grown in Texas on a very, very, very specific set of controls. 
I would argue it's probably the finest cotton you can get in the world. And then our artisans overseas crafted into these spectacular sheets. They're not inexpensive, but I think they compare to multi-thousand dollar sheets that you would find from other manufacturers. That's there. I have them on my bed right now. I'm telling you, it is like, it is an outrageous experience. It's incredible. Well, I may have to circle back for you on that one, but let yeah. me, you know, a guy can, I got a guy. What I'm referring to is the clothing that yeah. Sharapova wore, is that going to be available for sale? Will you the draw in addition? Let, I, you must that, that's, look. That's, we have, that's, look, that's a couture dress. It is a, it is a truly one of a kind. It's actually two of a kind because Vogue wanted to keep one. So we made another one for us to tour around. But, but yeah, that's Very, super yeah. cool. What other areas of marketing are working for Bowman Branch? Yeah, look, it's going to sound cliche to say, and I think, any business that's doing well in this economy, word of mouth is, needs to be the top of the list. And if it's not the top of the list, you're probably hurting today because the paid channels are challenging. You know, we have four or five years ago, we were spending 60, 70% of our marketing dollars on audio, podcasts, radio, things like that. And that's really what we built our business on. Today, it's probably less than 10% of our business. But we're very diversified. We spend a lot on TV. We spend a lot with influencer and social, paid social search, those sorts of things. We even do some print catalog, that sort of thing. So it's a very diversified marketing mix. And I think the key is, you know, you have to be reading your data and you have to look at what's really driving new customer growth. And then you've got to retain those customers. So the effort into retention and driving customer lifetime value and, and driving up, you know, purchase value and things like that. Those are just as important as finding new customers. It's not just finding a, a volume of new customers. It's about finding the right customers. And I think some of the brands you've mentioned in the past that have maybe gone public and struggled, I think it's because they've acquired any customer they can, not thought about who's the right customer that's going to create the right amount of long-term value that provides stability for the business. So you've positioned yourself at a higher level than those I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Your mattresses start at prices that are well above the bed in the box, so to speak. Of course, yeah. Kind of in an interesting space, if I were to throw out a price point, I'd say for a queen mattress, $3,000 seems to be mm -hmm. about the right price point when many, whether it's Casper or Helix or others, or, you know, 995, there are plenty of 995 mattresses out there. Yeah. You built on this better price point, not only with the bedding, but also the furniture is more expensive as mm -hmm. well. So it's not looking for everybody, but it, it's looking for a better customer who cares about a better experience. Well, it's about making a better product, right? Anybody can go out, find a foam manufacturer and shove a mattress in the box like a taco, right? Like that was marketing before product. I believe in product before marketing. So at the end of the day, when we made a mattress, we wanted to make a superior mattress. And we arrived on the retail price based on where our cost of goods landed. And we do that with every product we make. And, you know, we're open, obviously we're a business, we're trying to make money. We're, we're not being egregious about it. And so, you know, we really try hard not to focus on, I need a product to hit X price point. We focus on, I need to improve upon this product category. What's it going to take to do? Well, it's impressive. I was excited when I saw the better price points in the space, because there seemed to be a lot of lower price points in the bedding space, whether it was top of bed, bedding basics or mattresses. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you found a very cool niche. And again, maybe going back to where you started, you figured out how to do this profitably. You weren't looking to just drive sales or interested in twofers or percent offs. You're building better product for people who care about it. And clearly that seems to be working. Yeah. We just didn't want to join the race to the bottom either. There's not, there's a lot of people and not much room on the train headed to the bottom of the market. And so we wanted to do something fundamentally better. And I think that's, you know, that's what our customers have come to, to trust from us. And it's, there's no secret sauce to it. Just, you know, drive higher, go north instead of south. The pandemic was unbelievably good for the home space. And the home mm -hmm. space has really been suffering or challenged post pandemic. How has the shift from pandemic to post-pandemic impacted your sales? So it's interesting. The pandemic was good for us, but I wouldn't say it was stellar. It was consistent and solid. And again, when you think about 
we sell products that people have to actively desire, right? We're not necessarily at that price point where it's like, you know, being a pack of gum at the front of a cash register and you just grab it as you go. Post COVID has been phenomenal for us, especially at a time when other brands have struggled. And I think the reality is what we're seeing is a lot of brands are having to drive quality out of their products in order to find ways to grow their margins to support the customer acquisition environment that we're in. And we haven't had to do that, but that's created a much bigger delta from a product quality standpoint between Bull and Branch and a lot of the others, especially the DTC brands. And so COVID was good. I think it was stellar for a lot of others. The years since have been a real struggle for them, and, and we're continuing to see solid growth. And I think that's based on reputation and the fact that, you know, look, we, we aren't moving our pricing around like a ping pong ball either. People know what they're going to get from us, and we've been really consistent. Technology has impacted retail in a pretty big way, certainly over the yeah. past 20 years, but more, much more aggressively so over the past couple of years, especially with AI being the rage. What technology are you looking at today? How are you leveraging technology to continue to scale Bowl and Branch? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go out and say we're a tech company because I feel like that's been said by a lot of companies that are now bankrupt, but we do you know, look, we have to think about technology and we have to think about technology as it comes to the customer and the customer experience. And so AI is a great example. You can check my inbox. And while we've been on the phone here, I probably have 50 emails from people that are selling me a different AI chatbot or something relative to customer service. How much is that going to actually improve the customer experience? Probably not that much yet. It's coming. Um, so we're trying to be really smart about where we deploy it. And we try to think about the customer from with all of our technology. What helps them get from the point A to the point B that they want faster and more efficiently, right? So if it's, I forgot to add my coupon code, can we do that through an AI chatbot and they can be done in 30 seconds? Absolutely. When it comes to, you know, hey, UPS marked my package is delivered and I can't find it. You just put them in a cycle with an AI chatbot, their head's likely to explode. So we've got, we're trying to be really thoughtful and predictive with our analytics to make sure that we're giving the right amount of human intervention as early as possible without using human intervention to elongate the customer cycle. And, you know, technology in general, we've invested a lot of money into making our website faster, right? It sounds simple, but simply making our website faster, making it work better, looking at usability, looking at usability studies against different demographic segments, right? Like, you know, most digital agencies, we don't work with any agencies anymore. We do it in-house, but most digital agencies, the employee base there are tech forward, tech savvy, you know, younger folks in their 20s and 30s. When we're reaching a customer base that is 60 year old, 70 year olds, they're underserved by who's doing the UAT testing inside of a, in an agency. So we think about our testing with a really diverse array of customers and make sure that we think about usability from the most tech savvy, but also to the least tech savvy. And those have been areas of investment that we've seen a really fundamental improvement in conversion and whatnot, simply by just being thoughtful about the customer base. So, you know, in general, I think about using technology as a way to, you know, how do you make that customer experience better? And, you know, on the backside, yes, there's things we can do that make our lives easier, but let's put the customer first. You're a high energy person who's passionate about the business. How would your team describe you as a leader? Look, I hope they would say that I am I am consistent and fair. Look, I spend a lot of time at work, um, and I will tell you that I've worked for people that have made the time I spend at work not not fun, not good. And so, you know, I try to remember that everybody's here and their time not here is the most important part of their day. So let's make sure that the time they have here is as valuable as possible. So I try to be really transparent. I have folks on the team that are interested in starting businesses one day. Okay, join a call with Catter right? Sit in on it. Hear what it's like to run a business. And so, you know, I always say to people, I will always try to make the right decision for the company. And you can count on me to always try to make the right decision for the company. More often than not, that's going to be the right decision for you. But there are times when I have to make a right decision for the company that might not feel as good for you. And just understand that I'm trying to be as consistent as I can with my decision making. And, you know, and I think when you do that, you know, we're very lucky. We've had incredible retention of our employees. We've never had have any layoffs or anything like that. And people tend to stick around and, you know, it's not lost on me that when someone's spending their career at your company working with you, like 
that's the ultimate thing someone can give you is their time. So I certainly feel like I owe them back making sure that they're getting the opportunity, the exposure. I don't micromanage. I'm an, I can't micromanage. I'm, I'm way too ADD to, to micromanage. But, you know, I just try to, to let them have the opportunity to feel like they're working in a small business and they can succeed. They can make mistakes. Nobody's going to yell at them. And, you know, and I think at the end, I think one thing that's really important with growth companies, I'm sure you see this all the time. There are founders that it's all about them. And then there's founders where it's all about the company. And I never want Bull and Branch to be all about me and all about this. Yes, we're the founders and there's an element of we started this, but there's no way this business is here today. If it was just Missy and I, trust me, I would have bankrupted us at some point. There's no question about it. As you look at your career, is there one facet or one thing that you've done that you think has made you most successful? Absolutely. I did not start a business right away. Um, so I started my career in consumer goods. Well, I had the opportunity to learn from some incredible people. And as I look back and I started my career at Nabisco, which became Kraft Foods, I could just continue to rattle off a list for you of people that made a profound impact on me. Just, you know, I may not have worked for them, but just from sitting in meetings and observing how they think, how they attack problems and challenges and, you know, these really big, complicated businesses. You know, my first job, Ken, was scanning resumes that came in in the mail and feeding them through a scan. And so, you know, I truly learned at, at that at that level that even though that job sounds mind numbing, and it was, it's still yet another cog in the wheel. And to me, that was my entire day. That was my life. And so, I don't know if Jim Kiltz, the CEO of Nabisco at the time, knew I was doing that, but somebody had to, and it was important for the company to work. And I think that gave me the perspective that, you know. Nobody has this sort of God complex that sits on top of a business. It requires, you know, it requires a team and the team with the best players wins. And, and so the advice I always give to young entrepreneurs is don't be an entrepreneur too early. Great advice. Scott, we're going to conclude with rapid fire. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right. Favorite streamed show? Succession by Miles. Who would you most like to meet? My dad's father. If you didn't start Bowl and Branch what would you be doing right now? I would have probably started something else and it would have probably been more on the technology side. Favorite vacation destination? Anywhere with a beach. Final question. Whose bed would you most like to make? Oh, gosh. You know, it's not going to sound great, but I'd most like to make my mom's bed. She passed away right before I started Bowling Branch and I think to have the opportunity to, to show her what we've done would be pretty amazing. Scott, I want to thank you. And uh, before we jump off, I do want to add that you were generous enough to add a discount code, a Pilot20, which will get you 20% off your next purchase at Bolin Branch. So don't wait too long because it will be good through the end of July. Yep. Pilot20, I highly recommend our beach towels in July. It's like my favorite product we make. They're unbelievable. But anything... And thank you, Ken, for, for having me on. You're always someone I've looked up to, and this was fun. Well, it's great to see you today, and thanks for being on The Retail Pilot. And with that, we will land this journey. Thanks for tuning in to this week's flight of The Retail Pilot. And please give us a review on your favorite podcast platform.